We've now seen how we can calculate the price elasticity of demand for any point along a linear demand curve. We just take two points that are equally distant from the point we're interested in, use those two points to come up with our change in x and our change in p, and then use the point itself to come up with the p and the x. And this way of calculating the elasticity will get us the right answer so long as the demand curve is a straight line. But when it's not a straight line, it'll only give us an approximation. There is, however, a way of calculating price elasticities that'll always give us the right answer, no matter how the demand curve is shaped. To see where that comes from, imagine taking those two points and moving them closer and closer to the green point, until they lie just about on top of that green point. In that case, the change in x and the change in p is very small, and we can rewrite this as dx over dp times p over x. That first term is now the derivative of the demand function with respect to price. So how would we implement this way of calculating price elasticities? Well, we would have to know what the demand function is. Here we have a demand curve, and we can see what the equation for that demand curve is by just recognizing that the intercept is 200 and the slope is minus 2. But that's not a demand function. That's a demand curve. Remember that the demand function and the demand curve are inverses of each other. A demand function tells us for any price how much of the good x we're going to consume. So we need to get x on the other side. We need to invert this. We can do that by just adding 2x to both sides. We'll get 2x and subtracting p from both sides. We get 200 minus p. And then divide by 2 and we get x is equal to 100 minus 1 half p. Now we have a demand function, and so we can apply this formula for calculating price elasticities. So the price elasticity would be equal to the derivative of this, which is just equal to minus 1 half, times p over x, but not just any x, the x that's actually relevant for that price level, which is given by the demand function. So we'll put in 100 minus one-half p on the bottom. So this here is actually x of p, the demand function. Now we can simplify. So 2 times 100 will give us 200. That one-half and that one-half, they're going to cancel. So we'll just have a minus p on the bottom. And on the top, we'll have this p in the negative sign, minus p. So now we have an expression for the elasticity of demand that tells us for any price what that elasticity is going to be. Plug in 150. We have a minus 150 on the top and we have a 200 minus 150 or 50 on the bottom. That gives us a minus 3. Minus 150 divided by 50. Plug in 100. We get minus 100 on the top. 200 minus 100 gives us 100. So the, that gives us a minus 1. Plug in 50, we get minus 50 divided by 200 minus 50, that's 150. So that'll give us the elasticity of minus 1 third. But now we've got a general formula that tells us for any point on that demand curve what the price elasticity is. How would that work for more general demand curves? Well, remember then when, that when we had an indifference map, that we represented by the utility function x1, x2, when that was our utility function. And when we maximize that subject to the budget constraint, we got a demand function for x1 that was equal to i income divided by 2 p1. So that's a demand function. We can now figure out what's the price elasticity of that demand function. We just apply our formula, the price elasticity is equal to the derivative of that with respect to the price. So I always forget the quotient rule for differentiating, so I always write everything as products, i over 2 times p1 to the minus 1, 
and I can apply the product rule. So it'll be minus i over 2 times p1 to the minus 2. Subtract 1 from the exponent. That's the first term. That'll be multiplied by p over the demand function. i over 2 times p1 to the minus 1. That looks messy, but there are a bunch of things we can cancel in here. i over 2 appears in the numerator and denominator. And then we have a bunch of p1s. That's a p1 as well with exponents, so we have to add and subtract exponents. We start with this minus 2, multiply that by p1 to the 1, so we add the 1, that becomes a p to the minus 1. And then we have a minus 1 down here, when we subtract that it becomes a positive 1, so minus 1 plus 1 gives us 0, so all we're left with is p1 to the 0, all the prices cancel. And we end up with just a negative one. So that tells me that for this demand function, the price elasticity is equal to minus one everywhere, regardless of what the price is. What would that demand curve look like? Well, remember that when the price elasticity is equal to minus one, consumer spending remains the same no matter what the price is. So the demand curve is going to have to have a shape that looks something like this. So that when the price is this, we know that the spending box is price times quantity. So it's this box here. If we raise the price, what we lose here must be roughly equal to what we gain here. When we raise it again, what we lose here must be roughly equal to what we gain here, and so forth. That's often called a unitary elastic demand curve. A demand curve with unitary elasticity, elasticity of minus 1 everywhere. So we've now seen an example of a demand curve where the slope is the same everywhere, which means the price elasticities are not going to be the same everywhere. They're going to be different at every point. And now we have a demand curve where the elasticity is the same everywhere, and we can see that the slope is going to be different everywhere. Of course, had we used a different utility function, we'd get a different demand function, and that would give us a different expression for the elasticity of demand. This unitary elasticity is a special case that emerges from indifference maps that can be represented by Cobb-Douglas utility functions. So we now see that we can take any demand function and just use this method to calculate an expression for the price elasticity that allows us to plug in different prices and figure out what elasticities are at different points or that give us a single elasticity that's true along the entire curve. Knowing that this is how we think about elasticities with respect to the price of the good itself can also get us to think about other kinds of elasticities. So here we're thinking about the consumer's responsiveness of their consumption of the good X with a change in that good's price. Sometimes we actually call it an own price elasticity. We can also think of a cross price elasticity. A cross price elasticity simply thinks about how responsive is the consumer in terms of the consumption of X1 when the price of another good, the price of good 2, changes. And we'd use exactly the same formula, except we'd have different subscripts. So it would be dx1 with respect to dp2 times p2 over x1. Just what's the percentage change in my consumption of the good x1 when the price of the good 2 changes by a percent? Or we could come up with the income elasticity of demand. That's just the change in x1 with respect to income times income divided by x1. As income increases by a certain percentage, 
what's the percentage change in my consumption for the good X1? How responsive is my consumption to changes in income? So you can think of these other kinds of elasticities that relate not to the own price demand curve, but to the cross price demand curve or the income demand curve. But we're typically not going to be concerned about these. What we will be concerned about is the own price elasticity of the demand curve, which you now know how to calculate.